ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the MBS Show Review and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Senzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I have braved the Pacific Pony Card. Ah, and how was it? It was the most excellent time. Ah, anything interesting happened? Define interesting. Was there world-shattering events? Were there new alliances forged and betrayed? Was there a lot of fun? Yes, those. Had that? Well... I don't know about world-shattering events. It, depend, it depends on the individual. There were a lot of fun events. There were a lot of things I was very glad to have witnessed. I can give you a full play-by-play -play if you wish. Probably later. Uh, for next week, probably. Who knows? I don't know. Pro probably. 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 Yeah, probably. In this episode, um, well, we're going to continue off where we left off, which is uh, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff makes things a really, really complicated and confusing. Um, we're going to continue on with movies that we watched in 2016, part two, with how that one came out and this one is coming out. I, I think it's what, there's a gap of two to three weeks so, sorry about that. <laughs> Not to worry. This is just how things sometimes go. Oh, true that. And before we officially start, I need to pimp out that the show has its own Patreon. You guys can catch you out at patreon.com slash the MBS show. And over there, well, for now, we're not going big. We're just starting out small. Um, we have $1 what you want to call this tip jar if you're willing to you know give us tips or five dollars for things that you want us to talk about as for now it's only open to one slot um we're gonna try and do it on this show where once a month we kind of take your suggestions and we'll discuss or review on it like if you have a movie that you want us to review or a topic that you want us to discuss we'll try do it once a month Terms and condition may apply, so be very careful with what you ask for. Terms and condition apply. Apply now for a low, low rate. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think so. Anyway, besides. Side effects may include swelling, talking in tongues, head spinning, locusts, and clogging. Oh, wow. That, 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 that last one doesn't sound good, no. I may be mispronouncing it. I'm, I'm talking about dancing with those giant wooden shoes oh, in no. Holland, I believe. Oh, no, not those. Uh, but what? They, they look marvelous. Yeah, true that, true that, and they give you a swift kick. Oh my! Well, I wouldn't kick. I wouldn't kick my worst enemy with those. That's when you want to end a rivalry forever. <laughs> I remember Jackie Chan using those in one of his movies. It looks cool. Hmm. I'll have to double check that. I need to know. Yeah, I forgot which movie though. But anyway, um, like I mentioned before, this is part two of the movies that we watched for 2016. So I'm going to start it off with one of the movies I saw, and that movie was Captain America Civil War. Oh, yes. What an excellent movie. Yep. And well, in this one, Captain America, Steve Rogers, and Iron Man, Tony Stark, don't see eye to eye on things, and they start fighting. And... This, hmm, how do I put this? I've played the game, the Marvel Ultimate Alliance, and I think Ultimate Alliance 2, and they did a brief story on the Civil War thing. So I kind of got a bit of the info that they wanted to tell us, and I know about the comic of how the good guys don't like each other, and they fight. And in this one, they strip down to the bare essentials where it's just the bare essentials. Captain America disagrees with Iron Man and they fight. Um, why did they fight? It's because that Tony Stark is in or agrees with the government about heroes registering their secret identity or just listening to the government. While Captain America doesn't agree with that because if you register or if you follow what the government say, technically you're not doing your job as a hero. You're just doing what the person in power wants you to do. I do love this, uh, both the idea in comic form and the movie expression. In the DC universe, you have to have world-shattering uh, conquerors and dimensional despots. To get things going in the Marvel universe, you just need an act of Congress. <laughs> Yeah, but in all honesty, I do like how the cinematic universe handles this because 
if you look at how the comic was done, it's much cleaner and better. You, it all started with some superhero going berserk and destroying a town. And this one, it just takes the government noticing that, hey, the Avengers are causing havoc. The New York, the uh, foreign country thing, and the, in the recent one, the Africa thing, like, they did a lot of bad or they were not governed. So now the government wants to control them so they don't wreak havoc. There's a certain social commentary in the comics of how, how this gets going and how people, in a lot of ways, recruit the deceased to champion their cause. And at times it's sympathetic, but at other times I just think, oh, lady, you're, the, the spearhead of this movement is a mother who lost her son. Mm. That, oh, you're, I feel bad for you, but at the same time, you are ruining people's lives in the name of your son. Well, for the movie version, it's kind of the turning point for Tony to kind of agree with what the government say. If you really think about it, right, having someone with all that power and not have responsibility for what they do is scary. It is, and it's it's interesting to see... uh to see Tony make take the stances throughout the movies, you know, the second Iron Man, he was thumbing his nose at the government all the way through. Yeah, and I do see in this one, he matured a bit, where he knows the wrong that he did and wants to make things right. And I don't fault him for that. Especially when he gives that speech. Just two sentences. Ultron. My fault. Yeah, true. <laughs> true that. And in all honesty, Ultron was a project that he did to kind of take care of the world but somehow it went AWOL and destroy that country I I forgot what's the country's name do you remember off the top of my head I do not I know it was in Russia quote unquote Russian country or West Europe West Europe but either way things did not go very well and so it's sort of funny the more these crises arise people are like we need the Avengers know they're the reason this keeps happening (laughs) Although I will say this within the movie, Vision's argument that there might be a correlation, I found that baloney. Really? That's assuming a lot of guilt for the world's woes. I don't know, because I, the way I look at it is, I do understand why Vision said that, because do you know the yin and yang balancing? I do. I, I'm lightly aware of the Tao concept of balance. Light and dark, hot and cold, masculine and feminine. But following that, basically Vision is assuming it's they who cause the crises. How does he know they aren't the response to the crises? Well, it's either or really because, how do I put this? When uh, We'll take the first Iron Man, for example. Because one greedy person wanted to take over um, Tony's empire. He sent off to kill Iron Man, but one person who was greedy kind of turned the tables on Obadiah and in response Tony did his Iron Man thing and it's kind of a balancing act where good and evil tries to balance things out and in the end Tony emerged as the winner and from that point on it escalates to trying to make things balance again Possibly, but then that, but then you can't remove the heroes willy nilly and expect the rest of the world to just comply. Next thing you know, all the villains are like, I'm sorry, you you actually got rid of all your heroes. Thank you. Getting all the money is just going to be so easy now. And by that time, it's a bit too late, so you need to have the perfect balance. And uh, did you remember that one bad uh, Justice League animated series where all the Good guys turn to fascist dictator status and stop all crimes. Oh, the Justice Lords. Yes, that episode. Technically, that's what would have happened. No balance in the yin and yang scale. So the world, even if it's peaceful, it's still not peaceful. It's hard to say, but I I, I feel that Vision is imp- is imparting too much responsibility on them. I mean, ultimately, the villains were going to be... Oh, going to switch switch shows for a moment. There was a Batman animated series where Batman was put on trial by the criminals. Oh. And his and his defense was a uh, 
uh, prosecuting attorney who was not too fond of the Batman to begin with. <laughs> okay. And she said, basically, if Batman weren't around, you'd still be awful people. The gimmicks might have been different, but you'd still be the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. If anything, it's not he who created you, it's you who created him. Of course, they find Batman not guilty, but they're still going to kill him because they are awful people. Oh, true that. <laughs> I think the similar topic applies here. For all the reasons people question what the Avengers do, the simple truth is they were there out of necessity. Oh, yeah. That is also true because at the same time, too, when you really want to overanalyze it, if let's just say that if Thor haven't went down to Earth, would the alien invasion even start? Probably. Again, they might not have had Loki at the at the helm. But it would have been I think there would have still been an invasion. So it's inevitable. Uh, inevitable? Uh, how do you say that word? Uh inevitable. Yes, I inevitable then. I think so. I mean, maybe the timing would be different, maybe the Chitari would be different. You know, maybe a different force, but there would have been an invasion sooner or later. We've, we've gotten off track into all sorts of superhero philosophizing. Yeah, true. But I also just feel like pointing out, this does sort of highlight that the Marvel Cinematic Universe does not do a good job with their villains. Yes. No one after this was uh, saying, you know, oh, Baron Zemo was like the bestest ever. No, he was just some guy in a trench coat or hoodie. And in all honesty, the Marvel Cinematic Universe villains, uh, they die in one punch. <laughs> it's just one punch, man? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's sad to say, but in all honesty, like Baron Zemo in the Marvel cartoons is a pretty interesting character, even with um, who else is one of the... Ultron. Ultron is also another character that's a reoccurring in the cartoons. And, well, it's sad to see them be annihilated in one shot. Yeah, the movies don't want to have... For some reason, they avoid recurring villains as much as possible. Which is good because they get to play around with other villains. But, uh, I don't know. It seems that they have a huge end goal to play around with like Galactus and Loki and so on. Because if you think about it, um, who was the Guardian of the Galaxy's villain? Um, Ronin, Ronin the Accuser. He, from what I've seen in the, uh, whatchamacallit, this Guardian of the Galaxy cartoon on Disney, he seems to be one of those recurring characters, but no, nah, not in the movie. Oh, not in the movie, not in the movie, he dead. Yep, unless they Ooh. have some kind of Deus Ex Machina to bring him back. At which point he'll reappear, he'll reappear before the Guardians and say, Jacques. Ha ha ha, that's off. And then people will be like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but getting back on track, what do you think of, um, Civil War? Like it? Oh, I loved it. I loved the humor. I loved the appearance of Spider-Man. Total, f friends and I were totally fangasming over that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, th that Spider-Man reveal, like, Okay, honestly, the trailers ruin it, but gosh dang it, was it really cool where Tony just came in and say, Kid, I want you on my team. <laughs> Under ruse. Uh, he came in and uh, that talk he had with Captain America when he was just holding that plane priceless. And Jeremy Johns, uh, who another reviewer I enjoy, he said, if you don't change your mind on who you who you support, you're probably a fanatic. Well, I must be a fanatic then because I didn't really change my mind. Mm -hmm. I didn't say, oh, no, uh, Tony's got the right of it. No, Tony, 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 in my eyes, his heart was in the right place. His methods were not. Uh, but I, I did empathize with him. I understood why he felt the need to do this. So you're you're saying that you're a supporter of Captain America then? I am. I I guess to borrow a quote from Steve, I'd rather have faith in people than institutions. Mm. And I'm on the same boat because I totally wholeheartedly agree with Cap. Even though I can see Tony's point of view, it's just that 
no the the world uh, with how it is you you guys have to be independent you you cannot be governed under any one body of government who watches the watchers basically yeah true that uh, there's also that point too because if you're above the law who's going to govern you and it brings up the whole question because it's a really good philosophy because if you're some guy with a lot of power who's going to take Who's going to be, who's going to hold you account for your mistakes? Who's going to hold you account for your responsibilities and whatnot? Who's going to drive you home <laughs> tonight? Uh, but still, uh, I like the movie. It was pretty awesome. Oh, it was, it was one of the best movies of the year in my eyes. The airport battle scene will live on in, inf- in fan nostalgia for decades. Oh, yeah. But I, I think that's the only attraction, uh, attract, I, I think that's the only point to the movie where it was really attractive. But beyond that, like, hmm, a bit lacking in some parts. Really? I got a kick when uh, Steve is is uh, kissing his quasi-girlfriend. And then he looks over and, and his both Bucky yeah, and yeah, yeah. Falcon are like, nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, besides the other memorable parts, like the movie itself only has a few memorable scenes. Like, the airport scene is going to be one of the most amazing ones ever. But beyond that, like, okay, the Iron Man and Captain America and Bucky fight was pretty awesome too. But beyond that, like, there's nothing much I can remember of the movie besides Spider-Man. Spider-Man's awesome. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. But I say, if you have the chance or if you haven't watched it, go watch it. So, Silver, what's next on the list? What have you watched? What have I watched? Well, let's see here. There's so, there's so much uh, good that I could talk about. There's a lot of good movies. But let's talk about one that was just bad. Oh, wow. Well, bad. All right. Independence Day re- Resurgence. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, that one I have not seen yet. So, do sell it to me, my friend. Or try to keep me away from it. Hmm. I can, maybe it's a little bit of both. In all honesty, uh, it is trying to be as hokey, pro-America, go human race as the last film, but with none of the charm. And there's a very big reason for that. The premise is that after the events of Independence Day, it's been like 20 years since, uh, since the aliens invaded. And we have adopted the technology our world has changed, and that's probably the biggest thing working against us, in, working against the movie, us being the audience. We watched Independence Day as America and the world trying to react to these hyper-advanced extraterrestrials. Well, now we are hyper-advanced ourselves. We're not the underdogs in this fight. We're just a little less developed. And as a result, the world is no longer recognizable. It also doesn't help that they weren't able to get any. The only big players they got back were Jeff Goldblum and oh shoot, who plays who plays Jeff Goldblum's character's father? I forgot his name, but I do know the character. Yes, and the president makes a return, but like Will Smith couldn't show up. They do their best to close the story of the old generation and launch a very boring new generation. The the main characters in this were not interesting at all. In fact, one of them, you remember in the first Independence Day, Will Smith's character had this annoying wingman who's just signaling every death flag you can imagine. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, they do that again, but this time the guy is there for the whole dang movie. Oh, really? No. He's there for the whole movie. You're like, I want you to die. <laughs> uh, Why won't you die? No, like either you kill him off in a very cool, awesome way, or you kill him off in a very sad way. Like, make his death meaningful. Oh, there was no meaning to this. There was only, we thought this guy would be funny. You thought wrong. Wow. Yes. So wrong, so wrong, so wrong, so wrong. And that makes me a little sad. It's not like I want to, it's not like I want to cheer for character death. But here we are. The threat is physically bigger as the ship covers like a quarter of the earth. There's talk of this queen. Oh, there's this queen. 
Brent Spiner, his character comes back in a much more significant role. And part of me wants to just spoil the whole thing because I feel like it's not really a good investment of your time. I'll go ahead, man. And yet they're... Really? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, okay. like, uh, it's what? This is one of the movies where I have a strong feeling that nobody's surprised. The, let me guess. The American people won, right? Well, it's supposed to be the world, especially there's a heavy theme of uh, America and China working closely together. But in the end, it is all American imagery and and expressions that win the day. Uh, there is another alien presence, a giant sphere, which I call the eyeball, because that's <laughs> what it looks like it was made by Apple. Oh, God. And it is supposedly from a collection of resistance fighters to this alien race. And it's bringing even more advanced technology, and it wants all of humanity to lead the resistance against these aliens because we're that awesome. Really, you know. But it also, I think it's also worth promoting, there's a note of sexism in this movie. Not just that whenever a, a female pilot shows up, all the male pilots talk about who wants to have sex with her first. Mm-hmm. The president in this movie is a female. Okay. And yet the world keeps losing and losing until she's killed off and a, and a gruff general, male general of the U.S. military takes over. Uh. And I thought, okay, that might not have been intentional, but I can't help but draw the parallel. Yeah, like even for me, I haven't seen it and I can say that. Are you trying to say something about this? <laughs> Nothing good. Yeah. But, uh, like, in all honesty, the first Independence Day was cheesy. Cheesy. Yet fun. It's, it, like, I think the nostalgia put it best, like, Boomer, he died for our sins. Not Boomer! And uh, I think what made it work was the characters. Like, uh, Roland Emmerich is not one, uh, it's not a really great director. He is a director. He knows what he wants. That's a lot of fish. But in all honesty, most of his movies are eh, by the numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sometimes you just want a popcorn flick. I mean, there was grand spectacle oh. to to all this. But in this case, it didn't work out. And that's just the way of it. It's not worth a viewing in my eyes Maybe if you had a good laugh at it at its expense, but all things being equal, I don't believe it's worth the investment of your time as an individual. Yeah, I, I would say if it's on TV, probably catch it then. Although maybe I can get the sacrifice complex going. I viewed for your sins. Oh <laughs> uh, well, so that's uh, not watch. I don't watch right. Eh, let's give it a pass. The fir- Watch the original one instead. That that one was awesome. I seen that one and yeah, I can just say that even though it's dumb, it was still good. I think the Nostalgia Critic sold me on it with that last part where Jeff Goldblum and this, uh, I don't know, Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum were in the plane and they're hiding. <laughs> yeah, they're just ducking out. <laughs> yeah. And he's, vo- and he's voicing the alien. Oh, Sherry's. <laughs> How I long to see you. Yeah, that made it for me. Uh, but anyway, if, if you want a popcorn flick, right? My next movie, yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are invoking the B word. Uh, B? Not the B for Bay. Uh, you may say that, but this movie is directed by Dave Green. No, I I see the puppet, but where's the puppeteer? Uh, I I think you mean the guy who's giving all the money. <laughs> the guy, the, Michael Bay's fingerprints are all oh, over this. True, thing. true that. Like you mentioned before, um, if you want to have a popcorn flick, um, and just nonsense, this is it. This is literally it. <laughs> How do I even? put this in words where you know what I'm just going to read the synopsis from the movie web page uh, the sequel to the 2014 hit movie based on the comic characters created by Kevin Eastman and Peter Leard will once again be produced by Michael Bay and Platinum Deuce Dunes a studio 
Paramount Pictures directed by the screen screenwriter by that's not even a Ay, that's not even a synopsis. Ah. That's because that's because as far as I know, I've not seen this, but I've heard talk about it. But as far as I know, there is no story which to speak. Yeah. Characters just sort of do things and then they stop and then they do things and then they stop. Uh, Bebop and Rocksteady, while welcomed by the fans, are not really beloved. They're, they don't really do anything. There's like one fight with them between them and the turtles, followed by a fart joke. <laughs> yeah, but in all honesty, um, with the turtles, like in this specific movie, um, the turtles res- uh, are quote unquote the heroes of the town but nobody really knows and Michelangelo feels well you know what we should get the credit not um Venkman Peter Venkman was it Peter Venkman was the Ghostbusters oh yeah Vernon yeah Vernon Vernon yeah not Vernon but they had an agreement where Vernon would get the glory while the turtles you know still stay in secret and whatnot but uh, Shredder was caught and Sent to jail while in between transport, the Foot Clan somehow managed to find a way to set Shredder free. And long story short, they fail, uh, the Foot Clan got Shredder back and hijinks ensue while transporting Shredder with some mumbo jumbo teleportation device. He was intercepted by Krang. The alien from the movie, you know, the belly guy? Oh, I remember him fondly. I've seen the photo of Crank basically punching himself into his robotic suit. Yeah. But anywho, um, Crank tells Shredder, gather the pieces of this thing so I can launch a full-scale invasion. And Shredder just says yes. And long story short, it's a race to find the things before Shredder does or else the world's in trouble. And as I recall, uh, Leonardo is being a bad leader, but then that's never addressed. Michelangelo wants to try and become human, but that's never addressed. This is, stop me if I'm becoming repetitive, but it seems like, from what I hear, a lot of things were introduced, but none of them were followed through. Yeah, that's one of the few problems that the movie had. Like, Leonardo and Raphael never see eye to eye. And... Leo wants to stay in the shadows while Raphael wants to, you know, be normal, be out in the shadows and, you know, be appreciated for their hard work. And it goes back and forward. And in the end, I just say that this movie was popcorn flick, but not really worth the admission fee. I would say that if you want to just have a laugh and riff track it, this is good. Oh yes, there'll certainly be a riff track. Oh yes, but other than that, nah, this this movie is not worth price of admission. It's fun, but it's not really worth it. Uh, I would just say, if you've seen the first one and curious about this one, yeah, go ahead. But other than that, nah, if you want a good turtle show, I would just say, go watch the Nickelodeon cartoon series, the 3D Turtles. That is a much better representation of the characters. That one, I, I thoroughly enjoy that one. And waiting for them to resume it again, though they'll just lead into another cliffhanger for months on end. Oh, yeah. But still, you get Karai. Karai is a good guy in this one. Well, quote unquote good guy. And you know what? The history of Karai is all over the place. It's Shredder's daughter, it's Splinter's daughter. Yeah. It's all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but anywho. Silver, what about you? What's next? Let's see here. Next up on the list. Okay, since I just since I took down Independence Day, let's talk about something fun. Let's talk about Finding Dory. Oh, yay! Wait, didn't we talk about that one on last episode with Sappy Selection? May have. I've got my list pulled up, but I may not have uh, taken it off. Just in case we already did, I'll just say... It's a wonderful movie. I disagree with folks who who pan it for being just more of the same. I thought it it brought a lot of better things to Dory. Yes, it relies heavily on sequel itis, but it works as a sequel. 
it's still enjoyable. It's still lovable. And so I, I'd recommend it to anyone. Yep. I have to agree with that one because, um, Finding Dory is a really fun family movie. And you know what? It's a perfect sequel or a perfect ender for the movie because we got no idea where Dory came from. Okay. In all honesty, do we really need to know? Um, when I first heard there was going to be a Finding Dory movie, I was groaning about it. But when I saw it, I was, you know what? I enjoyed it. Like, I'm not disappointed that I watched this movie. It's pretty cool. And by the way, fun fact. Did you know Becky the Bird? He's voiced by Black Griffin. <laughs> well, Griffins are part bird. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Yes. It's funny cause ponies. Yeah, we need to get into ponies. So on my book, I say go watch Finding Dory. It's a fun movie. Yes. And talking about ponies, <laughs> uh, this is cheating, but I don't care. My Little Pony, Equestria Girls, Legend of Everfree. Ah, uh, you cheeky devil. I know. Uh, but still, it's a movie. It's on movie web's list, so I'm not gonna say no to it. So yeah, this movie, what, what can I say that we haven't said in our movie review of this one? <laughs> well, I can throw in an interesting, uh, no wait, sorry, that's, it's better than the third movie. Yeah, uh, y- yeah, but in all honesty, this movie was kind of a fun one. I'm seeing a pattern here where most of the Equestria Girls movie are, well, just to set things up. Like, the first one is to set things up for, hey, there's a, another dimension where humans exist. The second one is, hey, uh, we want to redeem Sunset. Here's the redeem story. And the third one is, hey, we want to introduce you to the twilight of this universe. And the uh, fourth one is, hey, our heroes have powers now. So now let's introduce a supervillain in the fifth one. Huzzah! Yay! I'll buy it. That's the words they want to hear out of the target audience. Yay. <laughs> but in all honesty, I don't really mind. Like, uh, I, I don't want to say more about this movie because we already reviewed this one. We We dedicated a full hour to this movie. So... Go ahead and check our reviews. It's in the uh, playlist. Go ahead. It's there. It's fun. I think we had fun, right? (laughs) We had fun. Now go watch it. (laughs) Do it. Yay. Uh, But anyway, Silver, what about you? What have you watched besides the ponies? Well, you can can certainly count on this movie to show up. Oh. The Accountant. Mm, I have not seen it. (laughs) Well, it's, it's an interesting one. It is the story of a man with... He is high functioning autistic. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a genius accountant, uh, who can do th- who can track things that no one else can see. But he's also very shady. He he cooks the books for some of the most dangerous men in the world, and presumably women. But you know, equal opportunity only goes so far, I guess. So the FBI is trying to track him down while he is investigating a laundering scheme at a very powerful, uh research division and this guy is not only a skilled accountant he's a skilled combatant so when people try to cause trouble he is just messing everything up and summarizing it some in some ways does it a disservice it's just seeing uh how how this plays out what it all entails how the relationships unfold it is very well done in my eyes but it's hard to truly understand what it's about unless you see it the advertisements, the trailers for it, were very vague. And so you weren't really sure what he was all about. But Ben Affleck did a great job. The father character in this was especially interesting because he is such an awful father. I mean, good Lord. I am so... This movie made me treasure my dad all the more <laughs> uh, because I thought I didn't end up with someone like this. To spoil it just slightly, this was a father who believes that if you're stubborn and forceful enough you can just sort of breed the uh problems out of anything oh wow there's no nurturing in this man there's only getting more angry oh wow this doesn't sound good he's a lousy father and that turns out to be a very big theme within the movie it also had one of the most poignant quotes i've heard in a while from the film 
I never realized my big opportunities until they had passed me by. Oh. I thought, oh, that that's kind of poignant. Yeah, that's deep. Put that on a t-shirt. I actually quoted that at Nightmare Nights. Oh, how did that go? Well, first someone said, no spoilers! And I quoted it, and it's like, if you can if you can take a spoiler from that, I I, I salute you. <laughs> someone quoted it. Uh, still. But you know what? It sounds really interesting, the, the way that you describe this movie. Um, have you seen Leonardo DiCaprio's and Tom Hanks run at uh, Catch Me If You Can? Oh, yes, and the father in that. The way that you describe this movie reminds me of that one, but instead of... Um, Ben Affleck's uh, guy being an accountant and just running away from the cops. He's packing. He knows some kung fu, yo. Well, in the fighting, he's not even really running from the cops. He just knows when to when to bow out. Believe me, the relationship gets more relationships get more complicated, and I won't go in heavy into spoiler territory. Mm. They, they get the sense though this guy is not running from anyone. Oh. I mean, if anything, people should run away from him. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm seeing here that Rotten Tomato gave it a 51 and it's a R-rated movie. Would you, what would you say? Well, I can certainly see why people would put, give it a Rotten Tomato as it's not, it's not like the greatest study of what it means to be autistic in this world. It's not the greatest action flick. It's a weird compromise between all those topics. And so it's not going to grip everyone. So I guess I can only recommend with a caveat, it might not be for you. But like the film says, we never notice our opportunities until they pass us by. Hmm. All right. All right. So, so, aha. See, I'm reintegrating. Ha, Yay. ha, ha. All right. And well, <laughs> going with Ben Affleck here, you know what? I'm going to go and say that Suicide Squad, I've watched that. <laughs> <laughs> Ben Affleck was in it. Part of it. <laughs> I'm just going to make this sound. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, um, so sorry, Squad. What about this movie that makes everyone say that they like it, yet they hate it? Oh, good lord. Well, in some ways, this is just negative association. I saw this with my friends at the Alamo Draft House, oh, which okay. is my favorite theater. But even your favorite has a bad day. That day we suffered terrible service. Uh, my friends were having very bad times. I was having a rough day. What was that? That was when I was trying to get ready for Twilight Day. Oh. And it's hard to describe all of it, but it just didn't work. And that's okay. But in terms of the movie, it wasn't just the service. It was the movie that didn't work. How can I say this is... It introduces a lot of characters. None of them are really given a lot of time to flesh out. In truth, Amanda Waller is probably the most interesting character in the whole movie. True. And, you know, from my views, um, I watched it at a local cinema. Um, I think i seen this one at a cinema called... Is it... Yeah, MBO. It's a local movie theater that I have here. And how do I put this? I won't say that... It's bad. Like, we don't have anything fancy like the LMO Draft House. It's just a normal theater where you buy your popcorn, you buy your drinks, and then go and get your seat. Uh, we watch it in standard definition, no 3Ds. So, yeah. But in all honesty, watching this movie, it was pretty fun. Like, it's, <laughs> it goes back to the fun popcorn flick. Yeah, some characters were not flushed out and some characters were kind of wasted. But in all honesty, it was a fun movie. Like, how do I want to even go on? Like, uh, you know what? I'm going to go for the positives. Like, Will Smith's character here was really likable. He's a murderer, but he's a really likable murderer. <laughs> but at the risk of sounding elitist, isn't it? Doesn't it feel like the same Will Smith character from Independence Day? No. No. Really? To me... I got the sense that I felt like I had seen this character before in a lot of Will Smith's films. Probably. Maybe. But you know what? Okay. I, I think the best way to describe this version of uh, that shot... That shot, right? Yes. Right. I think the best way to describe this that shot is 
if Will Smith pulled his character from... Uh, you remember that one movie where he's poor with his son, where he has to bring his son all around because they don't have a house? Oh, uh, was it The Pursuit of Happiness? Yes, that one. And Independence Day. Ah. And put them together. <laughs> Although when he's tempted with, with uh, the ideal thing, the daughter doesn't even feature, I killed the Batman. <laughs> uh... It's like, thanks a lot, Dad, you jerk. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, to me, I don't know how to say this, but I think that Will Smith pulled this character off. He's likable yet pickable. Like, you want to root for him, but at the same time, nah, you're not good. And Harley Quinn is an interesting character here, but I think they put their money too much on her. Oh yeah, they, they feature her very heavily in advertisements. Apparently the director's cut showed a much more abusive a uh, relationship between her and the Joker. Yeah, and the Joker was wasted. Not wasted, you know, wasted, but I think they wasted his appearance in this movie. Like, why? Why indeed? And El Diablo, I, I think they wasted potential on him. He was the most sympathetic in my eyes. Yeah. He knew he did wrong and he wanted to pay for his sins. But Amanda Waller say, nah, you're metahuman, we need you. We want you to help kill people. So, to save lives, you have to kill people. Oh, but that scene where Waller guns down her own staff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But still, it it's one of those situations where, for the greater good. The greater good. <laughs> yeah. But what's memorable about this movie? Like, what do you remember from this movie? Like, I'm trying to remember really, really hard now from what I like about this movie. And not much besides the whole end where that shot is teaching... His daughter, Algebra. I loved Enchantress's first transformation. Oh, yeah, that was cool. That was cool. But then came the absurdity of Enchantress when she's trying to build a machine and she's doing this really dumb dance. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to take her seriously. True. Oh, Captain Boomerang was fun, too. Uh, the, uh, the pony jokes. Hey, he has a sensitive sight, too. <laughs> I'm sure he does, but that's not quite the sensitive I think we're looking for. Uh, true that. But in all honesty, the Joker and Harley Quinn here, uh, wasted, like, there's the whole part where people are just complaining about, oh, Gerard Leto, Joker is gonna suck, or, oh, he's gonna be awesome. And from what I've seen here, he's just, okay. I'm trying to think of a way to combine awful and awesome to describe him, but the funny thing is that no matter what you do, you still end up with awful. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's not... He, how do I put this? His portrayal is not bad, but I think it's wasted. Like, why here? Why? I think they kind of pull off the wrong story here, because earlier on, there's a animated DC animated movie called Suicide Squad, funny enough. <laughs> uh, in, in that movie, that mission was to kill off the Joker. Simple. Go to Arkham, kill Joker. That's it. Go to Arkham, kill Joker, lather, rinse, repeat. Yeah, it works as a formula because Amanda Waller wanted to off the most biggest threat in the DCU, which is the Joker. You kill him off, things fall in line. Lex can be easily controlled with money or threats and other space alien monsters could be dealt by Superman and the Justice League. Easy. But the Joker is is the great wild card. Although that, that movie also showed Batman being totally fine with men getting killed. Which movie are you talking about? The cartoon or the, the animated. Oh yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that that was probably the greatest criticism. Batman just stands by as other people uh, are killed. It's like, for all his grim dark, Batman is still holds life precious. Eh, true that, but <laughs> uh, no movie's perfect. <laughs> you take that back. Star Wars was great. It's good. True, but remember that yeah. one scene where the stormtrooper hit his head. <laughs> That's just made it all the crater. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, for me, I say, if you're curious, go watch. Um, it's not a hunt-down movie, but yeah, it's fun. 
And you, Silva? Well, let's see here. I, I think it's worth seeing at least once. Mm-hmm. Just to experience it, you'll form a more solid opinion. I watched it not in the best mindset, but I wasn't as drawn in because every time they kept insisting we're the bad guys, I just thought, no, you're just in a bad story. <laughs> yeah. And again, I, I mean it. Waller is the most interesting character and arguably the true villain. Oh, yeah, that's true. And even in the cartoons and comics, she is one of the catalysts for getting things moving. Would I say that she's the villain? Uh, yeah, but at the same time, too, she's doing things for the greater good. The greater good. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to keep doing that. <laughs> I can't agree with her methods, but her methods work. But anywho, Silver, what about you? What's your next movie? All right, let's get real heavy on y'all. Mm-hmm. The uh, no, sorry, I keep putting the in front of this, but it, it doesn't have that in the title. It's Arrival. Arrival. Arrival, which is a movie about aliens arriving on Earth, but it is not an alien invasion movie. It is, it is the polar opposite of Independence Day Resurgence because it's. Artistic, it's stylized, it features a literally nonlinear story. You'll understand that when I, I'm not going to give that away, but Mm -hmm. it'll make more sense as you view it. And it brings up some interesting ideas of communication, how we phrase things, how we relate ideas and concepts and how those can create different forms, what it means to an individual. There are some heartbreaking choices. And uh, as one of my friends says, you go in expecting a sci-fi movie and you get a chick flick, <laughs> but you don't feel even a little bit let down by that. I enjoyed it. In fact, uh, after we record this, I'm going to see it again with a friend who's not seen it before. I'll be interested to know her take on it. Oh, all right. From what I can see here, it's... Okay, in all honesty, from this picture or the posters I'm, that I'm looking at, it's basically some kind of obelisks uh, floating around earth and you know when when you have something like that obviously the government is going to be on full alert because who knows this might be an alien invasion blah 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 and so on and i do see they have one of the avengers on standby hulk just having some tea i thought it was hawkeye uh he's 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 got he's a family man he's got to make the time for the kids got to put in time for the kids or the accountant will judge you as a bad father (laughs) Uh, although i will correct you on one thing norman it's not just one obelisk it's like a dozen oh really no all over the world and so everybody's rushing to make first contact and understand what they want and the and they're not really saying they're just sort of hovering there yeah yeah like yeah the poster shows well, from the posters, they didn't really uh, elaborate on what I'm seeing. But now that you mention it, yeah, every obelisk is in a different location. And yeah, that, that too. Uh, one of the posters says, why are they here? Well, that's that's kind of the important thing to tell you. But we, I can't say why. It's the whole point of the movie. To, to give it away would undermine everything. So I will just say, go see it. Oh, yeah. Witness, yeah. behold it, cry, because it's very sad. Oh my, and phew, came out on November 11, 2016, and is a 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Huh, cool. 100%, there's a rarity. Yeah. You know what? I, I'll i try and catch this when I can. This seems interesting. And you say that it's quote-unquote a chick flick, but is a chick flick that you really want to pay attention to? It's, well, okay, chick flick implies it's in- instantly bad, which may not be fa- fair to people who like those films. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more emotional and less hardcore, hardcore science adventure as one might think. And it's, it stars a very confident, intelligent woman who does all things right, but at the same time, she's not surrounded by idiots. Oh, that's rare. It's hard to strike that balance, to have a female protagonist who is empowered without depowering everyone around her to make her look better. That is truly a challenge. And so I'm glad they rose to it. Well, it seems like a really good movie. So yeah, um, Silver recommends it, and I say I'm interested in watching it. Yay. Yes. And let me take the quality level down to Warcraft. (laughs) You fiend. (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. So I watch Warcraft. <laughs> um, I'm I'm sure you did. Yep, I, I I did, I did. So, um, how how do I put this? Um, Warcraft is pretty. It had really awesome graphics. The orc were orcish, and the human were humany. <laughs> Um, yeah, sir, humany. How is it with all this Labrador armor? No one is like teetering over on the side. Oh, going down again. <laughs> uh, maybe they put um, their points in strength. I, I don't know. But in all honesty, this was a pop conflict, true and true. Would I say that it's worth a watch if you're a fan of the movie? Yes. Um, apparently, it's doing well in China or did well in China, and there's a possibility for the second movie. And Yes, um, for a film of this magnitude, um, game, movie, and whatnot, it's okay. Um, it had interesting things about it. And if you played Warcraft, not World of Warcraft, but Warcraft, it kind of follows this line there too. So yeah, people who were excited or people who are excited for their game being realized into a real life movie, are going to be 50-50 on this. Either they're going to be highly entertained and like it, or they're going to be disappointed. As for me, I was entertained by it. I do like some of the things that they did and whatnot. I have not seen it, and to be honest, as I've never played Warcraft or World of Warcraft, and I have friends who play World of Warcraft, and I swear it's a foreign language. <laughs> I honestly, there are times I want to scream at them. I don't speak your demon tongue. Tempt me not. <laughs> Leroy Jenkins. That I do understand. <laughs> and that is celebratory. But all in all, just like, I can't do this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, honestly, would I say that it's worth a watch? Depends. It's a, it's a lot of depends. If you're a fan of fantasy movies, like, um, how, what, what's the movie I'm thinking here? Um, medieval kind of setting, this would be kind of your movie. If you're a fan of magics, this would be your movie. Not to a high degree, but in all honesty, it's just entertaining. And yeah, you you might find it entertaining. I hope the second movie does better. <laughs> Are you not entertained? Yeah. Uh, but besides that, Silver, what's your movie? What have you watched? Let's see, what have I watched? Oh, there's so many things I've watched. Oh, by the way, this is my... I have two left on the list. Oh, oh well, you ca- you tackled Suicide Squad off my list. Let's talk about... Have we talked about Star Trek Beyond? No, I haven't seen that one. Like, a friend of mine was really, really interested in watching it, but somehow our times were clashing, so we didn't have the chance. But from what I heard, it was okay. It was a fun movie. It was, in some ways, it was more welcome because, uh, how to put this? Up until now, Star Trek has been, the reboots have been trying to make the Federation darker, grimmer, less idealistic. In a sense, this happens, but really, it's more about Kirk and company are once again representing Federation ideals in the face of an aggressor who just happens to be tied into Starfleet's history. He's not of Starfleet. And it's humor, it's it's action. Uh I watched the fight scene where uh where they're basically defeating enemies with the power of music. Yeah yeah. Yeah Guitar Hero that thing. It was just a high old time. I will say I think people are looking a little more for the idealism and and heavy concepts of the old Star Trek. These newer, more action-oriented ones probably feel more disappointed in that regard. Huh. I can see what you mean by that, because if people are looking for the philosophical Star Trek, I don't think they'll get it in this one. Not really this one. There's the, there's the question of the ideals between unity and individual strength, but it's never explored as the central focus. It's more just an arguing point between the cast. I'd recommend it for fun, but maybe not for the deep insight. All right. And by the way, um, this movie's not directed by DJ Abram. <laughs> well, people seem to really resent him for Into Darkness. Why? Besides the almost obvious one, but I thought that was interesting. I like that movie. 
I'm not sure myself. I think it's that they feel he's making it too violent. Violent? Really? Yep. And maybe, oh, what was the term? Some of the camera work. Hmm. Too many Dutch angles? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, basically, I think you you could declare it its own nationality with all the Dutch angles. Uh, it's been a while since I saw Star Trek, um, the, the second one. What was it? Into Darkness. But from what I can tell, I did like how they took a old classic and spin it into their own that made people angry. <laughs> it did, but, you know, I wish I had a clear answer for you, but... People dislike what they dislike. It's mm, hard true. to keep tabs on anything. Yeah, true that. I mean, I, I don't understand why Abrams did it. Because they wanted to kind of twist the story a bit and make things different. Because we all know that Spock dies in Star Trek when Khan kills him off. And instead of doing the obvious, they changed it. And some people might call that heresy they might go heresy destroy it <laughs> but that's besides the point um what about this one beyond does it follow an original storyline or is it a remake of another previous story uh as far as i can tell it is an original storyline ah although there is a humor in that there was an episode of the original that dealt with the historical aspects that they touch on here though it's not just a rehash of that story Okay, so you're telling me it's a one-to-one, <laughs> one-to-one remake? Oh no, no, not, it's not at all a one-to-one remake. It is a very, 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 very different thing. It's more just, I found it funny, the, the concept of the Federation's more violent past coming back to haunt it. Ah. Uh, at a certain point, but it is not by any means a rehash, and the old episode is not a required viewing. Ah, uh, alright. I'm seeing here Rotten Tomato gives it a uh, 85%. So, yeah, that's cool. Well, it's better than a lot of fans would say on message boards. This is why you don't really pay attention to message boards. Yeah, some diehard fans are not going to really enjoy certain things. Like, there's the purist and there's the elitist. And some people like things and some people don't. And yep. we're just here telling what we like and don't. Exacto mundo. And since we're talking about the space thing, uh, there's two ways I can go for this. The obvious one and the strange one. You know what? I'm going to go for the most obvious one. So since you talk about Star Trek, I'm going to go for Star Wars. Or should I say Star Rogue One? <laughs> or should I say Rogue One? A Star Wars story. Yay! Huzzah! What can I say? This movie... Ah, this movie. If you say Finding Dory was a pointless uh, sequel, this one. Uh, why would you want to make a movie of the, what you call them? Uh, X-Wing pilots. Ah, uh, it's pointless. Nope, it ain't about them. <laughs> ain't about them. They, they get, they come out better for it, I think. Yep. The, the rogue pilots, at least. Yep. Ah, uh, so, Star Wars. Uh, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. What is this all about? Well, technically this is a sequel slash prequel to the, the whole Star Wars story. You remember the Death Star have this one exhaust hole where if you shoot a laser into it, it blows up. You're seriously asking me if I remember that. <laughs> if I... Who, a fan who watched it probably before you were even in diapers. <laughs> so I'm guessing you do know it then. Yeah, so basically, remember that huge plot hole? The huge plot hole? I don't know if it was a plot hole. I know Leia was not very smart in getting the plans to the Rebels. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to, quote, to quote how it should have ended. Yes, thank you, Princess, for flying here directly and leading the Empire to us when you could have emailed it. <laughs> uh, no, they, she doesn't have data. Well, no, that's Star Trek. <laughs> uh, but still, um, long story short, this movie is uh, what happened in between episode 3 and 4. It explains the story of how the rebels get their hand on such a very important piece of information, which is the blueprints to the Death Star. And it tells the story of a bunch of 
rebels or rogue people or misfits on how they got their hands on it. And in all honesty, it is amazing. And that plot hole I mentioned earlier, it's not a plot hole. One guy in the designer, or one guy who designed the Death Star made it purposely that way so that the rebels had a chance to destroy it. And the guy responsible for it, he doesn't like the Empire. Yeah, with good reason. Yeah, true. But still, oh my gosh, this movie was awesome. It was a fun movie. Now, I'll throw in that this is kind of weird. The Usually, I love character-driven stories. The characters in this are, as people have noted, very stock. You kind of know their beginning and end rather quickly. It's more the theme running through it that, uh, as a friend of mine put it, this is the French resistance of Star Wars. Yeah, true, true. It shows just how hard they had to fight just to set the stage for Han and Luke and Leia and Chewbacca, but he didn't get a medal at the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's poor him. But seriously, this movie here, it sets up a... Well, technically, does it really set up a few things for episode 4 besides the most obvious one, which is uh, the setting up of how to take down the Death Star? Oh, I think so. I think it did a very good job of setting up that, showing some of Vader's vulnerability. Did he? When? When you see him floating in a tank. Mm. Oh, that. Oh, that he says. Yeah, because I thought that was just him applying lotion on himself because of the burn. Well, it is kind of twisted that you're like, dude, you set up your summer home where? <laughs> yeah, you know what? Like, oh, uh, he's edgy. He's edgelord. It's his edgelord phase where he wants to be reminded of the bad times. <laughs> well, the expanded universe and all that says that's the one place he feels comfortable where all this hatred and anger really were born. Plus, it has the greatest Darth Vader scene in the history oh, of Oh, yes, yes, yes. Like, <laughs> oh, that poor guy overstepping his line. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, wh- why am I choking? Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm thinking of Vader on the ship. Oh, that one was cool too. That one was cool too. My my friend um, freaked out when he saw that. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, ah! And of course, it also has the greatest space battle scene. Oh yeah, like fight in space. That was so cool. You mentioned earlier that. Um, all the characters were stock. And you know what? Yep. I have to say yes and no, but I have to say that most of the characters here were memorable from uh, K2SO to Donnie Yen's character. Come on. Like, I'm one with the Force, the Force is one with me. The Force is with me. Like, come on. That, that is just awesome. All right, but that wasn't the Force. These are stormtroopers shooting at him. <laughs> True that. I'm like, come on, like, uh, he's blind and yet the rebels are putting a bag over his head. Like, come on. I'm blind. Come on. <laughs> yeah. this, is this really necessary? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but seriously, um, Star Wars, I just have to say that it's a really awesome movie. It is. It's a lot of fun. The criticisms, in a weird way, I can't refute any of them. Mm. And yet it remains a a fun ride and a very enjoyable movie because it just owns what it is. We're a prequel, but we're going to be a prequel done right. Yeah, it doesn't really overstep their bounds into, you know, here's the thing. All of the characters, spoilers, all of the characters died from the lovable K2SO to... The lead character, um, Ren, Rin, Ray, something that could have or might be a Jedi, but nah, there's no hope for that one. Oh, are you talking about there's a new hope? Haha, <laughs> leading into the next movie. Yay. Oh, did you hear George Lucas is going to direct the next movie? Hmm, I wonder if it's going to be good. I don't know. I mean, there's this question of who shot first. <laughs> Ah, talking about who shot first, you remember those two guys that Obi-Wan cut off the hand of one guy? And they make a, they make a return appearance. Yeah, in, uh, Rogue One. It's like, I saw that, I freaked out, but my friend was wondering why I was freaking out. <laughs> 
Well, you're just excited for the handoff. <laughs> yeah, it is alive somehow. <laughs> but it's good times. Yes. But anywho, I say go watch it. Uh, if you're a hardcore Star Wars fan, I'm sure that you've already watched it. But if not, never mind. Uh, but anywho, Silver, what's your next movie on the list? On to the next. My next one, Doctor Strange. Hmm, how strange. That's my movie too. Excellent. Well, it's a, it's not the strangest thing I've ever seen, but it has some tr- really trippy moments like, whoa, if I were on a substance, this would be even more surreal. But it's pretty weird right now. I love this movie. This might, hmm, Captain America Civil War really got at the heart of these characters and their place in the world. Doctor Strange took us beyond that world. In fact, they, they even say, while the Avengers protect the world from physical threats, we worry about the magics. So it's just fun to see this fictional world. Benedict Cumberbatch is a great Doctor Strange. He's probably one of the per- one of the best fits. Nearly perfect. I will say once again, the villains aren't as impressive. They try very hard to push these villains. Oh, he was he has the same mentality as Strange. Oh, he's a dark mirror. But oftentimes it's just pointing out the the hero's hypocrisy rather than making the villain his own true character. And you're talking about Murdo, right? I'm going to say yes because I don't remember his name either. Yeah. So in all honesty with how you mentioned that M- Murdo or Mur- Murdo? Do? Murdo? 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 Mordor is where you go to take the one ring. I think he is called Mordor. Whatever it is. Like, um, he, I, I, I won't, I, hard words. I don't agree that he's the mirror to Strange as the villain, but I think that he's the paladin of the group where the rules make things or follow the rules to the T. Wait, I think we're talking. We're talking across characters. I'm talking more about the leader of the zealots oh, who, who are trying to destroy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's something different. Much uh, different. Sorry, my bad. Then um, I think that one would be who now? <laughs> uh, let's, let's just so, see here, Doctor. Uh, St- IMDb, save me. Wow, we are terrible. Well, this is what happens when your villain isn't all that memorable. I can't even recall his name. A rump? True. A rump that. Rump like, I, I'm trying to look for his name here, but, um, yeah, no, no. Seymour, I am uh, pro. Come on. Kessler, Kessler. Ah, Master Kaecilius. Now, now that, it, now that I see it, Kaecilius was sort of, was the mirror to Strange. You oh, know, the yeah. rebel. Yeah. The rebel without a clue. <laughs> and in all honesty, I didn't see him as the rebel. Like, I didn't see him as a threat at all. Not even as a threat? Even as he killed people? Mm, how do I put this? Like, he's so unmemorable that when you talk about Doctor Strange, you don't think about him. You think of Dormammu or even, uh, who's that guy? Um, well, Dormammu's one. Uh, who's the other one I'm thinking of? Uh, I, I, I forgot his guy, but, but yeah, Dormammu's one of them. One of the biggest, to be honest. Yes. This is what I mean when I when I say that Marvel villains are not memorable. Is there's Loki and then there's nobody. Well, you do have Mordo, Mordo, Mordu. You you know he, go ahead. he was more memorable as a fall from grace. He's not quite villain territory yet though. If you stick around the credits you'll see two after scenes events that really show what he's going through. Yeah. But like I mentioned before, he's the paladin, like the white paladin where um, the law is to be followed to a T. Oh, I see. So you blame the white paladin. Uh, I'm just using D&D terms. Oh, gosh. But anywho. Dude, you walked into that one. I am not apologizing. <laughs> oh, you. But still, um, Dr. Stranger, it's okay. For all our complaints and whatnot, it is a beautiful and well done movie. Oh, yes. The flaws of the villain are really the only thing. I mean, visually, it's stunning. It's wonderfully acted all around, including, I think, the villain. Mm-hmm. He just wasn't given that great a role. If you've seen Live, Die, Repeat or 
whatever title Tom Cruise is using for that one movie, mm-hmm. you'll appreciate the climax. Oh, yeah. And, well, the visuals here, like, okay, um, this is kind of a new territory for us as people who are new to Doctor Strange because before this, have you heard of Doctor Strange? Oh, yes, I had heard of him. But then again, I've been a fan of comic books, mostly Spider-Man, but Doctor Strange has come to Spider-Man's age uh, quite often. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know of him from uh, the DC Marvel uh, shows, uh, the, what you might call this, uh, Marvel vs. Capcom series, and s- some of the Marvel Avengers thing, and but that's about it. Like, if I didn't see that, I have a hard time understanding who he is. And even with me, knowing this tidbit of Strange, and also looking at Linkara's review of Doctor Strange, I know bits and pieces of him. But if I were to explain to my friend, okay, here, Doctor Strange is a magic, blah, 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 blah. Like, if I were to sit down and explain to him who is Doctor Strange, like, we're going to have a field day on explaining things like Dormammu, Sumagorath, and so on. Like, Nightmare even. Like, there's so much thing that's going on that's going to be so confusing for the general audience. And me watching this in theaters, and going in blind and not knowing much about him, the way that they did it was pretty awesome, and I got a full understanding of who Strange was. Yes, they did an excellent job of making sure you didn't have to know the lore beforehand. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think it might be even more enjoyable if you haven't, because then you have no expectations. Oh, yeah, true. You are free. Free! Yeah, Free, (laughs) Willie. Yeah, and... The way that they did this one was pretty cool. Like, like I mentioned before, the way that they did the movie with how they explain things on how they just generalize things were, is pretty awesome. And with the ultimate climax villain, Dormammu, he's almost wasted to a level where, you remember Galactus in the Fantastic Four movie? No, because I, I'm very proud of myself for having not seen that. Ah, alright. So, long story short, in the Fantastic Four movie, Rise of the Silver Surfer, the ultimate bad guy was Galactus. If you know Galactus, you know who he is. Uh, big guy, eat planets for funds and whatnot. Big hat. Yeah, wasted. Wasted in that movie. In this movie, Dormammu, almost to that size, controls his own realm, wants to go into our realm to take over it, but not wasted. He is done masterfully well. He is. He's more fun, although I will admit he is meant to be a god of this dark dimension, and unfortunately we've gotten so used to these beings in fantasy and sci-fi, they've lost <laughs> some of their grandeur just by volume. Ah, true, that too. But still, uh, knowing that the Avengers could not handle this is rather interesting. And so that, the, well, the Avengers find a way, but it'd be interesting if Doctor Strange gets involved. Oh, yeah. Um, but Doctor Strange does set up the another piece of the Infinity Stones, which is the Time Stone. You just got to think, sooner or later, everyone in the Marvel Universe is going to have a bad day. Uh, yep, true that. Maybe he and Vision can set up a support group afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, probably. And talk, talking about support group, did, did you see that mid card, uh, mid mid ending? The mid ending, uh, with Thor. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I don't drink tea. What do you drink? Well, not tea. <laughs> then it's like beer me, beer me. Uh, spoilers, by the way. Um, sorry. I, if that's if that's a spoiler, you know the next sequel is I think is Thor oh, Ragnarok, that. and uh, I'm so excited just because of okay, um, if you remember how that Thor dress in Doctor Strange is the same Thor that you you remember that short where Thor has uh Thor has this short with his roommate in Australia. No, I don't think I do. Oh, it's a, a long story short. Um, people were asking. Where's Thor in uh, Captain America Civil Civil War? Because Thor and the Hulk were gone. Assuming people were thinking like he's off to Ragnarok, you know that 
whole other scene that movie that's going to come out soon. But no, nah, um, uh, who's that guy? Uh, who 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 played Thor? I forgot. Chris Hemsworth. Yeah, Chris Hemsworth decided, or well, I think uh, Marvel decided to make a quote unquote short where he suggests hanging out in our world, Midgard, and just being a normal human, <laughs> staying at a normal house and whatnot. <laughs> Is this on the Captain America Civil War? Disc? Yes, I think so, yes. Okay, I'll have to check that out later, because I likes me some the Thor. And I'm not yeah. even impressed by his stellar, stellar pecs. Yeah, and he dresses up like a normal person. And that's what makes me think, like, oh my god, this is canon. <laughs> not uh, canon. No. I'm, just thinking like, I'm just thinking that, oh, Thor has a Australian roommate. Hmm. <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh, sorry, but it's just like freaking me out there. Ah, uh, so. Well, I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out! So, sorry to take your thunder, Silver, but, uh, Doctor Strange was my last movie for the year. Well, that's okay, I've only got two more myself. Oh, uh, right. It's all on you, man. I'm sure there were more, but we can only go so far. Uh, true that. Next up, we have a Born Again movie, Jason Bourne. Oh, that one. How was it? You know, I saw it with my dad, and he loved it. He had so much fun. And again, much like Suicide Squad, a negative association, this is positive association. You give my dad a something to enjoy, I will cheer for your movie gladly. But it is still the same formula of Bourne movie. He's on the run. Everyone's tracking him via TV monitors. There's an asset on his case. He says, kiss my asset, fights the asset, wins. <laughs> Uh, it's a super spy where Matt, Matt Damon as Jason Bourne has full on character shield. He can just walk through any area and just outmaneuver, outfight anyone. He has no, no real moment of vulnerability, moments of loss, but no vulnerability. But he's Jason Bourne. So, well, yeah, he's supposed to be the super spy. Super spy. But then, well, here's the funny thing. People, Somehow I I was reading up on archetypes and I found this site about masculinity in movies. And, oh, Jason Bourne represents total situational awareness. Dude, Jason Bourne represents total script awareness. (laughs) Uh, So he read through the script first? (laughs) He read through the script and knew exactly where he's supposed to go. Situational awareness, I think this is more precognizance. We're led to believe that he can predict where everyone is going to step as they transit from point A to point B. I think there's a level of control that is just not realistic. But it is still fun. It is The Jason Bourne movies may be petering out. It might be time to just let him vanish into the unknown and work from the shadows for good. And truth, I wish I had deeper insight, but really that is the movie in a nutshell. Jason Bourne is awesome! (laughs) Well, at least you had fun and you had a great time with your dad. Yes, so oh, there's no complaints there. It's a it's a fun movie, I think, to watch when you just want to enjoy some action violence. <laughs> but I think the earlier board movies were stronger. Ah, all right, then. But not the Born Legacy. I do remember the first Born movie being really awesome because of how um, he has amnesia, cliche, but he's remembering everything slowly, and yeah, that's pretty cool. I think it was the second Bourne movie that did it for me. Really? Um, that did it for you, like, enjoyed it a lot? Enjoyed it the most. Uh, not totally over the amnesia, but now he's out for payback. I tried to leave. I tried to bow out. You forced this. Now I'm going to get all of you. Yeah. Didn't that one movie, like, they kill off her, his girlfriend? Oh, they kill off his girlfriend in every movie now. Oh, yeah. It's like he's he's second only to Bond in being the touch of death for a woman. Oh God, no! I mean, uh. I mean with with Bond, I mean uh, going with him is is basically a unique form of STD. <laughs> oh, oh, you uh, you you shared some time with Bond. Well, you're dead. <laughs> It's the truth. It's love and God. So, what's your last movie on the list? This may not be the 
best movie because a lot of people love uh, Arrival so much. 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. That is impressive. But Kubo and the Two Strings. Oh. I adore this movie. Oh, I wish I had the chance to see it. Oh, oh we, you'll have a chance, and I recommend you take it. It is stylized. It is visually beautiful. The stop motion animation is just stunning. The characters are lovable. Kubo is a great child actor. Kubo and the heroine from Nice Guys are probably the two best child characters of 2016. The girl oh. from Suicide Squad can just go off be with her bad dad. <laughs> All right. Thanks for treating me to killing Batman while I'm right next to you. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> See ya. But Kubo, it touches on so many things. It has this great stylization. Uh, my friend Cruelica and I talked about the message to kids because in, it, it's not a Disney film, but in true Disney fashion, if you're a parent, you're toast. And we talked about why that is such a feature in stories for the young. Because at some point we, as we grow older, have to face the mortality of our parents. Barring tragedy, we will have to say goodbye to them. And these stories remind us that as terrible as it feels, there is life after. There is hope for the future. And that I really enjoyed. Now, I will say Kubo does introduce the issue of mind control as a solution to a problem, which will always raise my concerns. But this one was a bit more sympathetic than My Little Pony. <laughs> oh, wait, you don't agree with what Sonic Glimmer did? I don't agree with any of them did. <laughs> Love spells, emotional spells, wanted needed spells, re- reconciliation, uh, reformation, anything and everything. Mind control. It is terrifying. Uh, but in Kubo, they did it well? They did it where you got the sense they had no other choice, though there is a moment at the very end. It's like, okay, now you're just gold digging. <laughs> but still, um, I heard a lot of good things about it. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful movie. All right. There's another movie on my watch list. So that's probably my favorite movie of the year, though maybe not the most technically perfect movie. Uh, they could be hmm. two different things. Oh, yeah, I mean, um, you don't need to have, uh, hold up with this. You, you don't need to have the most perfect, perfect movie to be a perfect movie. I mean, like, um, uh, what, what was that other movie that people consider to be perfect? Um, very classical one. Yeah, it's a classic movie done by one of the greats. Hey, uh, ooh, Secret of Nim by, uh, uh Don no, Bluth? No, not that, but still, every movie has its ups and downs, uh, its positives and negatives, and how it shocked culture and whatnot. And for us, 2016 has been a roller coaster of great and terrible movies all around. And well, you, you heard us talk all about the movies, which one we like and which one we dislike. I mean, for us to say, oh, this movie is the best movie of the year, is saying that other movies are not worth your time. I'm just saying that, hey, you heard our opinions on it, and well, go catch them if you want to. Because personally for me, most of the movies I watch, I enjoyed. Especially Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> and Turtles. Uh, and <laughs> Silver, help me, I have a problem. I don't know if there's any solution. Well, actually, there might be one solution, Norman. Forgive me. Oh, ah, ow, my spleen. <laughs> oh, great. Now I'm in an Austin Powers movie. <laughs> uh, but still. So, you shot so, uh, me. Why did you shoot me in the arm? <laughs> <laughs> that movie is awesome. Oh, man. Maybe that one. We should do that one next time. <laughs> Just talk about Austin Powers. Will, yeah. will people be able to hear us through the giggling? <laughs> they did hear us in what? Um... Oh no, we didn't do a Kung Pao. Ah, never mind. Ne- next project, next project. But anyway. Next. <laughs> uh, Silver, what was your final say on this? There were, much like you say, there were some great movies in 2016, and there were some awful movies in 2016. But honestly, what works for us may not be the same for you. And that is mm-hmm. okay. Thank goodness movies, movies appeal to a wide spectrum of people, and people will love or hate a movie based on their own experiences. 
honestly, I think we can all we can do is point to the ones we think people will enjoy, and we just got to go from there. That's mm. basically what reviews are in a nutshell. Not telling you what is good or what's bad, but where we think a lot of the value lies. And then you have the freedom to choose what you what you enjoy. Mm-hmm. True that, true that. I mean, if you agree with our point of view, that's awesome. If you don't, do tell us because I do like to know what you think. Because, come on, if we agree on a topic, that's awesome. But if you don't, I'm interested to see why you don't agree with me because by you telling me why I get to learn more I get to be open-minded to other things and that's always a good thing so we will hope for good movies in 2017 although as we're recording this at the start of the year yeah this is the this is the time period where all the the stuff you want to be able to say this is the first good first good picture of the year it's the first picture of the year period <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, boys. Or was it the best movie of the year so far? You're in pretty shallow company! <laughs> yeah, true, that. I mean, uh, you know what? I'm not even going to go to movie web and check out what mo- new movies coming out for this year. Let's see. Triple X. Uh, Justice League Dark. Ooh, Justice League Dark! Eee, that's going to be cool. Lego Batman. Yeah! But that's coming out in February. I'm patient. <laughs> yeah, Lego Batman. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't wait for that one. Uh, but still, um, I think we should end this here and now because if we do, we can go for hours on movies that we really, wow, we're going for so long now. Anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I am Zizil Vaquil. And little guys catch you next time on another amazing show. See ya. Adios. <laughs> So anyway, Silver, you you know that thing that I want to talk about? You know, Kung Pao. Let's do it, man. Let's, let's do it. Kung Pao, enter the fist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm game for that. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that could be something for the future. That could be something for the future.